All right, this is Deuteronomy 23 in the MacArthur Study Bible. Let's begin. He who is emasculated by crushing or mutilation shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. One of illegitimate birth shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord. An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever, because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out from Egypt, and because they hired against you Balaam, son of Beor, from Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. You shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all your days forever. You shall not abhor an Edomite for he is your brother. You shall not abhor an Egyptian because you were an alien in his land. The third, I mean, sorry, the children of the third generation born to them may enter the assembly of the Lord. And when the army goes out against your enemies, then keep yourself from every wicked thing. If there is any man among you who becomes unclean by some occurrence in the night, then he shall, yeah, then he shall go outside the camp. He shall not come inside the camp but it shall be when evening comes that he shall wash with water and when the sun sets he may come into the camp also you shall have a place outside the camp where you may go out and you shall have an implement among your equipment and when you sit down outside yeah when you sit down outside you shall dig with it and turn and cover your refuse for the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and give your enemies over to you. Therefore your camp shall be holy, that he may see no unclean thing among you and turn away from you. And you shall not give back to his master the slave who has escaped from his master to you. He may dwell with you in your midst in the place where, which he chooses within one of your gates. Where it seems best to him, you shall not oppress him. There shall be no ritual harlot of the daughters of Israel or a perverted one of the sons of Israel. You shall not bring the wages of a harlot or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord your God for it for any vowed offering for both of these are an abomination to the lord your god you shall not charge interest to your brother interest on money or food or anything that is lent out at interest to a foreigner you may charge interest but to your brother you shall not charge interest that the lord your god may bless you and all to which you set your hand in the land which you are entering to possess. And when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it, will, and it would be a sin to you. But if you abstain from vowing, it shall not be a sin to you. That which has gone from your lips, you shall keep and perform, for you voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God, with what you have promised with your mouth. And when you come into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes at your pleasure, but you shall not put any in your container. And when you come into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not use a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. All right, may the Lord bless the reading of the word. Let's go through the notes here. All right, and you noticed in verse 1, it says if you are emasculated by crushing or mutilation, you're not going to enter the assembly of the Lord. 
Now, from the sanctification of the home and marriage in the previous chapter, Moses proceeds to the sanctification of their union as a congregation, and he speaks of the right of citizenship, including being gathered before in the presence of the Lord to worship. Now, most likely, this law did not exclude one from residence in the area where Israel was to live, but from public offices and honors and intermarriage and participation in the religious rites at the tabernacle plus later at the temple. So, so you did such a thing, you could not participate in such things, I guess. Thus not be a part of the assembly of the Lord. In the emasculated, verse 1, the illegitimate, verse 2, the Ammonites and the Moabites, 3 through 6, they were not allowed to worship. They were not allowed, yeah, they were not allowed to worship the Lord. The general rule was that strangers and foreigners, for fear of friendship or marriage connections, which would lead Israel into idolatry, were not admissible until their conversion to God and to the Jewish faith. This purge, however, describes some of the limitations to the general rule. Eunuchs, illegitimate children, and people from Ammon and Moab were excluded. Eunuchs were forbidden because, yeah, eunuchs were, oh, sorry, yeah, uh, where was I? Eunuchs were forbidden because of such willful mutilation literally in Hebrew, by crushing, which was which was the way such an act was generally performed, and it violated God's creation of man, and it was associated with idolatrous practices, and it was done by pagan parents to their children so that they might serve the eunuchs in their homes of the great. And probably a modern day version of this could be like child affirming, uh, gender affirming care, where you're literally mutilating the children as well. Yep, so this would be a modern day version of it. Well, here this was idolatry, idolatrous practices, but I mean, today it's, well, I guess really it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, well, re well it's rebellion against God ultimately. Yes. And yeah, you do, you did that in this day, and today you you do what we're seeing in our society today with the mutilating of children. Yeah, you would definitely be cut off from the assembly of God, ultimately, if you don't repent. Yeah, you'll be cut off from eternal life if you don't repent of such things. Yeah, and for the, pe and for the people that have done that, yeah, you can be forgiven, you can, you just need to acknowledge that sin and confess it to God and repent. So, and there's hope for those kids that have transitioned and regret it. Yeah, you can do that. There's hope for you. Yeah, you need to come to Christ. So, and for those people promoting this stuff, they need to repent. All right, and then the illegitimate were excluded so as to place an indelible stigma as a discouragement to shameful sexual conduct. And people from Ammon and Moab were excluded, not because they were born out of incest, which they were. Lot's daughters uh, slept with Lot, and that's how you ended up getting these two nations. But they were excluded from being a part of the assembly of the Lord on account of their vicious hostility toward God and his people, Israel. And many of the Israelites were settled east of the Jordan in the immediate neighborhood of those people, of these people. So God raised this wall to prevent the evils of idolatrous influence. Individuals from all three of these outcast groups. Yeah, now, yes, now these, now, here's an important thing. 
people from all of these different outcast groups, they are offered grace and acceptance by Isaiah upon personal faith in the true God and in Jesus Christ ultimately, yes. Isaiah 56 verses 1 through 8, and there's a promise right there. There's the hope for people that belong to these categories. Yeah, you can be forgiven. You can come to faith. Yeah, you can yeah, you can have eternal life. You just have to repent of such things and place your faith in Jesus. Amen. Nobody is beyond redemption. And and a good example of this would be Ruth the Moabitess. Yeah, Ruth was a Moabite, but she came to faith in God. Ultimately, when she went back to take care of her mother-in-law, Naomi, after Naomi lost her sons and uh, husband, they died. Yeah, but she went back to take care of Naomi, and she said, you know, I'm going to follow your God also. Your God's going to be my God. Your people are going to be my people. Yep, and she was drafted in. And she would marry uh, Boaz. And King David would be a descendant of Ruth. So Ruth is a part of the Messianic line. How about that? Yep, but there's a good example. You, know, you come to faith, you'll be a part of the family of God. Yeah. Yep, and then Rahab in Joshua 2, you know, she came to faith in the true God and she was spared from the destruction of Jericho. Yeah. All right, but anyway, but it says here that the people that would not be allowed to enter the assembly of the Lord... Yeah, they wouldn't be allowed to enter even until the 10th generation. Now, the use of the word forever in verses 3 and 6, yeah, yeah, they will, uh, yeah, they're not going to be able to enter forever. Now, it seems to indicate that this phrase is an idiom denoting permanent exclusion from the worshiping community of Israel. In contrast, an Edomite or an Egyptian might worship in the third generation. Though these nations had been enemies, Edom was a near relative coming from Jacob's family, while individual Egyptians had shown kindness to the Israelites at the Exodus. Yeah, I think the Egyptians allowed you know the Israelites to take some of the their stuff as they were leaving. All right, and then you get to some of these other verses here. But ultimately, if you repent and come to Jesus Christ, you will be allowed to enter into the assembly of the Lord. Yeah, which the church is actually an assembly of believers. You'll become a part of that if you come to faith in Jesus. Yep, ultimately. Yeah. Well, didn't it also give another reason why Moab was excluded from, from being a part of the assembly of the Lord? I guess with the people of Israel here. Yeah, you know, for those who would not come to faith, I guess, ultimately. Yeah, well, they gave the re one of the reasons because they hired uh, Balaam to curse Israel. You can read about this in Numbers 22 through 24. The king of Moab, uh, Balak, hires uh, Balaam to curse Israel. But of course, God turns Balaam's words into blessings. He can only speak what God wants him to speak. But Balaam was in it for the money, sadly. And he was ultimately destroyed. Alright, but anyway... but. But that's, I guess, one reason, you know. Yeah, but you come to faith in God, like Ruth did, you could become a part of it. But otherwise, uh, no. All right. And now you get to this section talking about the cleanliness of the campsite. And because the camp of Israelite soldiers was a place of 
God's presence, the camp was to be kept clean. Instruction was given concerning nocturnal emission and defecation and such instruction for external cleanliness illustrated what God wanted in the heart. Yeah. Yeah. And this is about, you know, being, you know, holy. Yep. Yep. Yeah, being clean on the outside, but more importantly, be cleansed on the inside. Yep. So whenever you go out to do your business, you better have a little shovel or something and you better cover it up when you're done. All right. And then verses 20, uh, chapter 23, 15, verse 15 all the way through 25, 19. Moses selected 21 sample laws to further illustrate the nature of of the requirements of living under the yeah the uh, synatic uh, covenant. All right. And then a fugitive slave also was not to be turned over to his master. Evidently, this had in mind a slave from the Canaanites or the other neighboring nations who was driven out by oppression or with the desire to know Israel's God. And I wonder if probably some of the people in the north, in the U.S., you know, that were for abolition of slavery, I wonder if they were familiar with this verse of not returning the oppress uh, returning the slave. Well, sadly, the slaves could get returned even if they made it to the one of the not slave states. Yeah, but anyway. But I wonder if they had that verse in mind as well with their abolition of slavery in the U.S. It's possible. But sadly, slaves could still get returned. But anyway, but here in ancient Israel, ultimately it's what it's talking about. You could not return a slave. So, so once again, you see God's uh, treat, uh, uh, basically God actually cares about the slaves and the Bible does not, does not promote the slavery that we think of today. It does not promote that. It does not promote the kidnapping of people or in this case, send, or if they escape, you know, sending them back to, you know, the master. Yeah, well, didn't Paul do that in Philemon? Didn't he tell Onesimus to go back to Philemon? No, yeah, well, he told them to receive him as a brother in Christ, not to treat him as a slave, to receive him as a brother. And, yeah, and he and he fled. I don't know why he did, but I guess he shouldn't have. Yeah, but even if you were still enslaved, you still needed to be treated well. So the Bible does not condone the mistreatment. But I guess in this case, if a slave probably is running from a master, you know, if it's probably for, if it was probably a bad master or maybe wanting to come to God, I don't know. But in this Old Testament law, they could not be returned. All right. And prostitution as a form of worship was forbidden. You, know, you could not, yeah, you could not use prostitution as part of worshiping God. I mean, this was part of the idolatrous practice of practices of the Canaanites, and you cannot bring wages of a harlot or the price of a dog to the into the house of the Lord your God for any vowed offering. Yeah, now dog was a reference to male prostitutes. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so if the prostitutes paid you money you cannot use that to give to God yeah it's an abomination and you cannot charge interest to your brother interest on money or food or anything that is lent out at interest so the prohibition of lending money at interest to a fellow Israelite is qualified by 
Exodus 22, verse 25, and Leviticus 25, verses 35 and 36, which, indicate, which indicates that it restricts its application to the poor and it prevents further impoverishment. But it was allowed for foreigners who engaged in trade and commerce to enlarge their wealth. So, according to Deuteronomy 15, 1 through 2, you know, talking about the sabbatical year where you would cancel off the debts that people owed, it's clear that money could be legitimately lent in the normal course of business, subject to forgiveness of all unpaid debt of all unpaid debt in the sabbatical year. Yep, all of it would be forgiven in that seventh year. All right. And then verses 21 through 23. Yep. You make a vow to God, you better keep it. You know, you better, you know, pay it. Otherwise, it's going to be a sin. Yep, you better do it. Though vows were made voluntarily, they were to be promptly kept once made. Yeah, you better vow. Yeah, it's better for you not to than for you to do it and not do it. And farmers were also to share their produce with people in the land, but the people were not to profit from the farmer's generosity. So you cannot put any of their you cannot put any of their produce or crops or whatever into your container. You cannot, you know, benefit. You cannot use their product for profit for yourself. But if you come into your neighbor's standing grain, you can pluck the he uh, you can pluck the heads of the uh, heads of the grain with your hand. But you cannot use a sickle. Yeah, which you know is you know kind of like that blade yeah you cannot use it to you know cut down the grain yeah especially if it's not harvest yeah but you could come in there and get some grain especially if you were poor and needy yeah yeah and this is about you know ultimately you know taking care of the poor as well in in Luke chapter 6 i think in the new testament there's a situation where the disciples are actually in a field plucking the heads off of grain on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees get mad that they're doing that, that they're doing that on the Sabbath. And then I think Jesus is like, well, you know, the holy bread, you know, only the Levites or so could eat it. But David was allowed to eat it. And this is in 1 Samuel. Yep. I mean, you're going to prohibit, you know, somebody who has an obvious need because of a certain rule. Well, even though this was a, even though they weren't breaking the Sabbath, they were just breaking the traditions of the, yeah, of the elders, which the Pharisees put on par with Scripture, and thus they nullified Scripture, and Jesus called them out for it. And I think in Mark 7, with the defilement, with, yeah, saying that they're not washing their hands and you're supposed to. Yeah, well, it's not what, it's actually what comes out of you that defiles. But anyway, but they were mad because, you know, they were breaking the traditions regarding the Sabbath. But really they were not breaking God's word because they were actually doing what God commanded them to do here. By, you know, taking the heads off the grain. So, yep, and Jesus said he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Yep, so, so yeah, he's in charge of the Sabbath. And if they were really breaking the Sabbath, wouldn't Jesus have stopped them from doing that if that was, if they were really doing that? If they were really breaking it by plucking the heads off the grains on that day? He probably would have stopped them. But no, yeah, because they weren't breaking the Sabbath, they were following this command of, plucking the heads off. So they were just breaking the traditions. Yep. Yeah, but of course, they got mad that he would break their traditions. Yeah, but 
did not break God's word, though, ultimately. He fulfilled it perfectly, and thus our perfect sacrifice for our sin, and only through him we can enter into the assembly of God. Amen and amen, and Lord willing, I'll see what Prager has to say next time. All right, God bless you.